So good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you joining us from around the world. My name is Barry Slowey. I'm the president of Cook Medical's Endoscopy Division. I'm based here at our global headquarters for endoscopy at our factory in Winston-Salem, North Carolina in the USA. Um, before we get into today's uh, exciting symposium, I, I wanted to give you guys a quick update on the Hemospray device itself. As many of you are probably aware, we recalled the Hemospray device voluntarily earlier this year. Um, and just wanted to explain the why behind that. We had some issues with cracking. Those of you that are knowledgeable about the Hemospray device know that it's got a plastic handle. We had some cracking of that plastic handle. We had about 22 cases of the handle cracking over a three-year period out of about 90,000. So 22 cracked handles out of about 90,000 devices that were shipped. So very low incidence. But we felt it was such an important device that we thought the right thing to do was to fix the problem. We called the device. We fixed the problem. We've recalled it. We've got FDA clearance. We've got CE mark. We're back in most markets around the world. And nothing has changed in terms of the device. The powder is exactly as it was and functions exactly the way it always has. But we have fixed that, that very low incidence of cracking. And we're excited to have this, this device back on the market today. So we have an exciting um, webinar here today. Obviously, normally, we would all be at congresses like DDW or UEGW around the world. And as we don't have that opportunity, we're excited today to bring the speakers to you. Um, our first speaker is uh, Dr. Rayhan Hadri from University College London, who's going to be joining us. I'll, I'll introduce him in a couple of seconds. But Dr. Hadri came to us about four years ago in 2016 and was looking to collect real-world registry data on the Hemospray device in the UK. And at the same time, some physicians in Germany, Dr. Ralph Kieslich, and Dr. Goetz, along with uh, Professor Emmanuel Cajon in France, were looking to do the same in France and Germany. So those guys all got together, and Dr. Hadry decided to set up this, this European registry um, to collect real-world data. There's a lot of perspective data on hemospray, but I think a lot of people felt that having this real-world large database would, would help us a lot in addition to having that perspective data to really get a picture of how hemospray is used in, in, in every day. A lot of the questions that we typically get about hemospray, such as, is it a monotherapy? Should I use it as a bimodal therapy? When should I use hemospray? Where does it fit into the hemostasis algorithm? I have clips, I have APC, I have bipolar probes. Where does hemospray fit in? So one of the things that the registry is going to allow us to do is to answer those questions of where does hemospray fit into the algorithm. Our second uh, panelist for today is a research fellow working with Dr. Hadri at University College London, um, Mohammed Hussein, who goes by Mo. And uh, Mo has been the one that's worked for, for the last four years on pulling this database together, many late nights, many weekends, putting together abstracts, putting together journal articles, uh, oral presentations, and there already have been a lot of publications in leading journals like GIE and Endoscopy coming from this registry. The registry now encompasses over 700 patients. It's growing rapidly, and it's not just a European registry anymore. It's a global registry, including centers from Asia Pacific, from, from the Americas. So, so it's really exciting. Um, our third panelist today is David Wagner, who works with us here at Cook Medical. David's our global medical liaison. And he's the one that has been interacting with a lot of people on this call and with these physicians over the last few years to get studies and, and registries up and running. David has worked with Hemospray for over 10 years and in the field of GI for more than 30 years. So the goal of today's webinar is to provide you with information that you would normally be able to get in person at meetings such as DDW around the world but most importantly, to provide you with practical information as to where hemospray fits in to your hemostasis algorithm, not based on opinion, but based on data. It's always good to hear people's opinion, but I think it's more useful to get that opinion backed by data. And what, what, what is the data telling us? So before we, I pass it over to our panelists today, um, 
To keep the session interactive today and, and to keep it interesting over the next hour, we're going to be using a polling software. So we're going to have a poll. We're going to ask you some questions and give you the, the chance to, to reply before we move to the Q&A session at the end. So if we, if we could put up our first poll question just to show how the system works. And the first poll question is a pretty simple question. Um, and it's really just a, a bit of fun to see how the system works. So the question is, what color is the dress? So you have two options. A, it's the dress is black and royal blue, or B, the dress is white and gold. So if you could go ahead and let us know, is this dress A, black and royal blue, or B, white and gold? I'll give you a little bit of time just to let us know, A, black and royal blue dress, or B, white and gold, just to make sure that the system is up and running and that you guys get comfortable with how the system works. So it looks like we have a lot of people who are not answering, um, but uh, the majority of the two options are telling us that the, the dress is black and royal blue. Interesting. Okay, so we're going to go on to our first serious question before I hand over to our panelists. We can have the next question, please. Um, so the next question is the first serious question, and that question is, how do you use Hemospray at the moment? So if you are somebody who is actively using Hemospray, do you A, use Hemospray as a monotherapy, or B, use Hemospray as a combination therapy? How do you use Hemospray today? A, as a monotherapy, or B, as a combination therapy? If you could go ahead and opt for either A or B, please. I'll give you a couple of couple of seconds to answer that question. Um, some people may use both, but do you primarily use it as a monotherapy or a combination therapy? A, monotherapy, B, combination therapy. So it looks like more people are using it as a combination therapy than a monotherapy. Okay, so at this point, I will pass it over to you, David, to uh, start the questions for our, our two distinguished guests. Thank you. All right, thank you, Barry. I really appreciate it. Um, gentlemen, obviously, I wish I could be with you in London, but uh, I think we're all getting much more experience with these kind of virtual presence types of, of presentations and meetings. Um, for some housekeeping issues, if anybody calling in is interested in more information about the registry, we can provide a way to contact Dr. Hadry's team at the end of the discussion today. And, also, um, we, Dr. Hadry, we understand this is literally an all-comers registry, and we're today looking at results regardless of label indication or location of the bleed in some cases. Uh, so we want to make the audience uh, aware that we will be discussing, in some cases, success rates and outcomes independent of the usage, as well as some some detailed um, detailed information. So. Really, I think one of the big things we know, you guys have been really productive. We've had um, presentations since probably 2018 all the way through 2020. Um, how have you seen, the Dr. Hadry, the, the registry grow over that time? Uh, so uh, good afternoon to uh, those of you that are, uh, that are in the afternoon, and good morning to those of you that are still getting out of bed. Um, First of all, just a, uh, a thank you to, to, to Barry uh, and to, uh, to David and also the team at, uh, at Cook for putting together this, this webinar. As, as, as you mentioned, the, uh, at the moment, the ability to have face-to-face -face, uh, symposiums or, or congresses uh, are, 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 are on hold, and, and this is our new way of of, of, of learning and, and and sharing. So thank you for putting it together. It's a real pleasure to be uh, on the on the call with um, uh, with Mo here at, uh, at UCH. Um, so uh, David, I answered your question about how the, the the registry has progressed over the past uh, two or three years. Um, as uh, as Barry alluded to, this initially started as a, a coming together of you know four or five high volume European centers to see um, what we could do to work together to try and better understand where uh, hemospray fitted into the algorithm of, of GI bleeding. Uh, and what became very, very obvious from those initial 
conversations four years ago is we were all asking the same questions uh, and we were all thinking the same things and we were all treating the same patients. Um, so really what we've seen in the in the last three years as the registry has has grown, one, we've seen uh, that the numbers of patients have, have, have risen steadily, uh, uh, over 700 patients and, you know, counting. Uh, and that has, you know, that reflects the increased use of the, the product, not just within the United Kingdom, uh, but as evidenced by the registry now, which is, you know, an international uh, registry with centers, in not, not just in the United States and Europe, but now in, in, in Australasia. Um, more and more people have not just got access to, to hemo spray, but are beginning to use it in clinical indications where historically perhaps we were limited. Um, and hand in hand with that, what we have seen, David, and you know, shared uh, through various uh, the, the forums, such as uh, the, the, the oral presentations at DDW over the past few years, and also the, the various publications that Mo has put together, is that the the efficacy of of, of hemospray uh, is is really very encouraging when we look at it um, away from what was historically perceived as just a just a rescue a rescue device a rescue therapy when all else failed. Uh, now I'm not saying that, that is still not a, an, an integral role for uh, for hemospray, but what we have seen certainly over the last 18 months, as the uh, the data have evolved, is that uh, you know in 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 bespoke clinical indications where case selection and lesion selection is uh, uh, is, is 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 done vigilantly, that hemospray can work not just in, in isolation, but in combination with other treatments to give uh, fantastic um, hemostatic rates, but also uh, provide a, uh, a reduced risk of rebleeding. Um, and, and, and then finally, in answer to your question, David, what we've also seen is that the, the, the array of indications where we can use this has, has expanded. Uh, uh, away from just pe peptic ulcer bleeding, and I'm sure we'll discuss during the course of this uh, this symposium some of the other indications. And I think that's really exciting because ultimately what we're all trying to do here is to treat difficult patients. You know, GI bleeding is a big problem. It's not just a, a UK-based problem. This is a worldwide problem where, uh, you know, often we we are scoping patients in uh, intense and extreme scenarios. And it's an exciting time to to have more products available to, to be able to, to help these patients and give them a good outcome. Great. Thank you. I mean, uh, Dr. Hussain, since you're the guy crunching the numbers, um, I noticed this year's DW abstract with these increasing uh, numbers of patients had slightly lower hemostasis rates and some slightly higher re-bleeding rates in that all-cause bleeding summary. Do you think the, I mean, what's happening here from your perspective about who's entering data and the types of patients being seen. Yeah, thanks, David. So I think the key, uh, so the DW abstract you refer to is taking into account all causes of upper GI bleeds. Um, and as the registry is expanded and, uh, and as the data set expands, I think more and more, it's more important to start breaking down this data set um, because uh, various results or various outcomes uh, will have higher re-bleeding rates than others. So it's more difficult um, to interpret it as, as one. Um, but a second point to note, David, is that uh, the Rockwell score and Blatchford score for all these patients are higher than you would expect um, because they're all from teaching centers and large teaching hospitals. Um, and so by, by default, there'll be a slightly higher re-bleed and mortality uh, rate as well. But uh, I guess we felt that would be the, the best uh, patient population to uh, try and see the effect of hemostasis from hemospray. But I think to interpret it as one is, is becoming more and more difficult, which is why we start to edge more and more towards breaking the data set depending on indications. Um, and that is the best way, I think, to try and identify a role for hemospray in, for example, peptic ulcers, malignancies, and post-endotherapy, 
to um, try and define where it fits in each of these guidelines separately. That, that's excellent. And it brings me to something else that was very mentioned. And also we talked about in the poll, Dr. Hadry, can you define or explain the difference between combination therapy and rescue therapy? So um, this is a, this, I'm, I'm really glad you brought this up actually, uh, David, because it is quite an important point uh, to, to take forward and to put across to our colleagues who, you know, are on this call. Um, is that you know the, the definitions of the, these two sort of categories or indications help to to define uh, where hemospray may have a differential role? So rescue therapy historically has been defined as when all else fails and there is ongoing uh, ongoing bleeding and ongoing bleeding defined as you know visible. Uh, a, 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 a blood at the tip of your endoscope or <clears throat> hemodynamic compromise after the procedure, uh, which is, is in keeping with, with active volume loss from, from bleeding. Uh, and that is after you have applied, um, you know, combination therapy. You know, the dogma is you use more than one endoscopic modality, modality to, to seek uh, hemostasis. So that that is... That is rescue therapy when you use uh, hemospray uh, in, a, in, a, in a situation where you have applied two modalities or three perhaps and there is ongoing bleeding. Um, combination therapy is, is different because this is, um, uh, you know, where you have uh, applied um, uh, a, a, a single modality, be that a mechanical therapy, uh, epinephrine uh, injection uh, or, or you know thermoablative techniques uh, and in addition to that you have then also used hemospray in that same sitting and that uh, after having applied both therapies uh, there is a, a cessation of bleeding so you can see uh, very clearly that the bleeding has stopped and as part of the uh, the, the very stringent definition for the data collection within the registry, it was, uh, you know, decided many moons ago when we, we, we put these together, is that you observe the bleeding, uh, uh, the cessation of bleeding for, for five minutes. Um, and then you're comfortable, that is, uh, at, at, at that uh, intervention, uh, either monotherapy or combination therapy that has led to, to, to a positive outcome. Well, thank you. I think that that helps kind of define the space for us a little bit and, and what constitutes rescue or the point of futility from a formal standpoint. I'd like to, I mean, some of that undoubtedly depends on the types of bleeding or the type, you know, where the bleed's coming from or the type of lesion. So I want to, before we move into the next section to talk specifically about peptic ulcers, I wanted to add up a, another poll here for, for the audience to kind of keep them keep you active. Um, hemospray gives what percentage of hemostasis in patients with peptic ulcer disease? disease? That's specific to initial hemostasis. And we've got three possible answers, 48, 73, 86, or 100 percent. So uh, let us know what you think uh, or your personal experience on that, and we'll check back in. Um, so in 2019, the paper that you guys published uh, with peptic ulcer bleeding, the patients appear pretty old. I mean, median age is 73, roughly half have hypotension on presentation, uh, almost as many are on antiplatelet medications or anticoagulants, almost, you know, over a third of those patients. Um, some combination of antithrombotic drugs is this the typical patient that you're seeing now, or is it skewed because of the, the high risk? I mean, what patients are you seeing in the hospital? Yeah, look, I think that's a, a, it's a, a very valid observation, uh, David, is that the, the cohort of patients that we are collecting in this uh, data set tend to be, I wouldn't use the word older, I'll get told off, they tend to be more senior patients. Uh, uh, but also, uh, as evidenced by the, the 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 risk scores that we've used, such as the Rockford, uh, the the Rockle score, sorry, and also the Blackford 
uh, scoring systems that help to prognosticate outcome and decision making uh, high in, in, in these co cohorts. So I think we had a median uh, Blatchford of, of, of seven and I think a, a median Rockle of, uh, sorry, a median Blatchford of, of 11 and a Rockle of seven, the other way around. Uh, and, and that signifies a, 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 a cohort of patients that baseline are already quite high risk. Um, and as you mentioned, these will be patients on, uh, on anticoagulation, there will be patients with comorbidity, uh, and by, by definition, when you sub-select that cohort of patients, we already know that their outcome uh, can be very, very challenging. Uh, and so um, I, I suppose you, I, I think I know what you might ask me next, which is why. Um, and I think that, you know, oh, it's, it's probably reflective of, of you know, where the, the patients that we're now scoping. If you look at the, uh, the, you know, there's over 20 sites now around the world in this registry. These are all sort of big teaching hospitals, tertiary, quaternary, academic centers. And so uh, the kind of patients that are frequenting our premises are, you know, these high-risk patients who are comorbid on anticoagulants are having cardiovascular intervention or for coronary artery stenting. Um, uh, and, you know, we are pumping them full of anticoagulants. And so, um, so I think that's probably reflective of the nature of the, 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 the recruiting centers that we've got these high risk patients. Um, and I think that's probably what's very promising because as you, you know, you've got this high risk cohort, but actually the outcomes uh, that, you know, your, your poll will hopefully uh, put us out of our, our misery, show that actually the outcomes are <laughs> in these... Yeah, well, the results actually do... Re uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, but the, the poll does say that the majority think it's 86%, and uh, so clearly they've read your paper. Um, and, 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 yeah, so maybe I can direct this to Mo. Um, so I've read the abstract that was presented at DDW quite closely and compared it to those 2019 results. And the hemostasis rates are slightly better in 2020, 89% versus the 86% in your paper. Um, but the rebleeding rates are also higher. So again, 19% versus 12.5% roughly. And this is, again, specific to peptic ulcers. Uh, although the seven-day all-cause mortality is lower in the most recent data, 12 versus 16 percent, uh, although the long-term mortality is unchanged. And I was curious, is, again, this almost a, a selection bias based on the centers that were entering data, or is there something fundamental that's going on with comfort using hemospray as combination rather than rescue? Yeah, so uh, thanks, David. So that's, that's an important question. So as uh, Rayhan mentioned, I alluded to earlier, um, over the years, there's been increasing use of hemospray. Um, and I think rather, it's, it's almost without formally putting it into guidelines, rather than using it as a rescue therapy, more and more centers have started using it as part of mono, but also combination therapy as well. And so what we've noted over the registry, particularly with the peptic ulcer disease cohorts, there's more combination therapy use. So uh, at the moment, there's about 200 peptic ulcer patients. Over 100 of patients were, had combination therapy for the treatment of peptic ulcers. And about 80% of the cases were forest 1A and 1B. So the most vigorous, um, uh, uh, vigorous of peptic ulcer bleeds. So uh, I think uh, increasingly it's, it's being used more uh, as part of a combination first-line therapy. But the more we start to weed out this data, the more interesting results we get. And we found that particularly in the combination therapy cohort, uh, when we analyze the results, there, there is a significant uh, reduction in mortality uh, with a P of less than 0 0.05 when we're comparing it to the monotherapy. And the, the majority of the Forest 1B and 1A cohort of patients, it's basically combination therapy being used. So I think, David, it's because it's increasingly being used in a larger caseload of numbers in uh, large teaching hospitals, but also in the sickest patients as well, which probably explains some of these results. That's interesting. I know there was a paper published recently from Spain where over 75% of the cases were as rescue. And interestingly, the, the re-bleed rate in that patient population, you 
is, is actually surprisingly lower than what you might expect, that what came out of it corresponds with what you're showing, that um, the, the mortality of patients is tied to successful hemostasis. And in uh, patients where that's unable to be achieved, the rescue use of hemospray is the most significant piece mm -hmm. of it. So I'm wondering how that translates from nothing else is working, let me grab this, to what point of utility do you, do you move that earlier to make it a combination treatment? Dr. Hadry, maybe you have a thought on that. Yeah, look, uh, the, the day, the, you know, it's, it's encouraging to see the data from Spain. Uh, actually, there's, there's, a lot of, uh, there's, there's a lot of very synergistic uh, outcomes there. Um, the, 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 the boundaries become slightly, slightly hazy sometimes between, you know, when you're going from mono to combination therapy. Um, but the, I think the most important point here is, is, is the type of lesion, uh, that, that we're treating. You know, we know, uh, from, 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 uh, Dr. Hussein's data and, you know, from the Spanish data that the, the sort of more high risk lesions, the, 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 the forest uh, classification, which we all know has been, you know, validated for, uh, for peptic ulcer disease, the, 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 you know, the, 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 one B and the two A's, um, are, you know, in, in combination therapy, uh, these patients are doing well, but also their re-bleed rates are, are, are fairly, fairly low. And, you know, and, and, and that is, um, on par with what's been published in, in historic series looking at other modalities. Um, and it's, it's refreshing to see that other independent data sets are, are, are mirroring our outcomes. Um, so so that, I think that's probably for me the most important thing. And, you know, the other thing we forget, David, and I'm always telling my colleagues here is in order for this to work, um, you need active bleeding. And so you know, don't, don't fix a problem that's not a problem. So un unless there is active uh, uh, extravasation of, 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 of red cells from a lesion, uh, you know, the, the, the product will not work because the way that it works is to form this, you know, to, to enhance the natural uh, clotting process. And so, um, you know, historically, we've been criticized for some of the slightly more low risk lesions, absolutely rightly, and we've learned along the way. Um, so, so I think the, the, the key, the, the message to, to a lot of the participants is, um, you know, your, your high risk lesions historically where, uh, you know, we would have, uh, issues with, with, with either, you know, combination of rescue therapy that, you know, th this is a real adjunct. Well, Mo, I think you've also pointed out that you're collecting some other information associated with these patients that may, may be supplemental to what is in the abstracts and, do you have any hints on say, transfusion requirements, lengths of stay, that sort of thing for these patients that impact the, the true cost of treating patients? Yeah, so um, we've, we've included data on uh, length of stay, but in terms of transfusion requirements, I mean, varying away slightly, but we're particularly interested, particularly in the malignancy cohort, uh, which we'll probably touch on later, uh, where it certainly shows applying hemi spray does uh, improve uh, the, the need or necessity for transfusion uh, before and after treatment with hemi spray um, to help uh, support uh, time needed uh, to bridge towards chemo radiotherapy or, or surgery or conservative management. Um, but yeah, so with with transfusion requirements and length of stay, we particularly focused with that with the malignancy cohort of patients. But it's something we're looking at now with the peptic ulcer cohort now as well, uh, with, the, with the new centers in the registry. That's actually a, a good segue, but you know, just to kind of summarize what you've told me is, for peptic ulcers, um, it, hemospray does have a role. It can, you know, the majority right now in the registry is probably half, slightly over half or combination with the other tubes split between monotherapy and rescue. If you see trends toward more combination treatment, and that the outcomes actually are pretty similar regardless of what you're showing, but there's some rationale for increasing comfort with the, with the product and how it's used in the types of patients driving that combination treatment 
rather than only um, the, the rescue scenario like we had early on. But I think you bring up the malignancy question. That's an area that maybe there is less controversy about. So I wanted to ask another poll question to the audience. Um, as chemospray is, you know, the, the standard of care often is for combination treatment, but for malignant therapy, hemospray is monotherapy, gives what percentage of hemostasis in malignant bleedings? Is it between 48, 73, 86, or 100%? Um, uh, perhaps you can uh, enlighten us uh, about what the actual results are, because I think there's some interesting things coming from the, both the 2019 paper and the subsequent DGW abstract on uh, malignant bleedings. Yeah, I'll throw it out. Who wants to grab that question? Yeah, David, I, I, I might take that actually, because I, I think that this is, um, I think this is a really interesting area, and, and actually. Um, I, I would I, I I would change the wording of that question. I'd be interested to see what the results are because, for you know, for 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 the other indications that we you, you know you've talked about, such as peptic ulcer bleeding uh, uh, or, or even you know post therapy bleeding, the the endpoint that you want to achieve with the application of anything, be that hemospray or or another hemostatic intervention is you want to stop the bleeding. And so hemostasis is indeed the right outcome and the right definition. Um, but for, for malignancy, I, I think that the definitions are, uh, are actually flipped around, whereas hemostasis almost becomes a secondary outcome. Uh, and, you know, we work in a big cancer center, and I, I think these are a poorly served population because they do not tend to present with the overt signs of GI bleeding that you see with our peptic ulcer patients, the melina, the hematemesis, the hemodynamic compromise. These are sick patients who have, you know, either primary or disseminated malignancy. And the way they will present uh, to our endoscopy suite is with chronic anemia uh, and all of the uh, sequelae and the, the, the morbidity that goes with that. And, and, and actually, um, I would turn the definition around. I, you know, Mo's currently working on a, on a manuscript that we're hoping to get out to the reviewers very soon is, is actually what you're trying to achieve in these patients is two things. Is your, of course, you want to stop the bleed, you want to reduce the bleeding or the rate of bleeding, but you want to reduce the, the rate of transfusion for blood products. That's what these patients uh, are dependent on, uh, you know, blood transfusions, blood products. And then obviously you want to look at, you know, hemostasis and quality of life. And so actually we flipped this round uh, and, and Mo hopefully can allude to some of the preliminary data. And what we've shown is that if you use hemospray as monotherapy in these patients with, 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 with cancer, uh, you can significantly reduce their transfusion requirements uh, after the, the intervention. And I think that is where we, we are heading. And, you know, we've learned this along the way. Uh, with with the registry, Mo, Mo, what are the data showing on on post uh, endoscopic application of hemospray in terms of transfusion requirements in the in the in malignancy patients? Yeah, so thanks, Ray. So um, so we've looked at over 100 patients um, with malignancy treated with, with hemospray, and and there's a couple of points to note. We found that half when you compare mono and combination therapy, the hemostasis drops from 100 percent of monotherapy about 84 percent in combination therapy and also in combination therapy there is an increased rebleed rate as well um, and, and the thinking behind that is really with tumors they are friable tissue there there's easy contact bleeding and so actually applying a second modality um, can sometimes uh, make things worse essentially and affect some of these factors so that's the first point to note from there is that really monotherapy uh, significantly improves hemostasis uh, bides the time to then allow for uh, multiple things, improved quality of life in these cancer patients, some of them are palliative, um, uh, the necessary surgery or radiotherapy, and allows them to get to that point. Also, the most important thing we found and noticed in terms of transfusion requirements before and after uh, treatment with hemospray is significant improvement in terms of number of units of blood required. And in quite a few patients, that goes down to zero. Um, uh, and, and we looked at it you know, a month before and a month after the endoscopy itself. 
So in, in a lot of patients, it goes down to zero units needed 30 days after a, a hemospray endoscopy, which um, allows essentially a lot of time for these patients to have the necessary treatment uh, uh, needed. And again, another thing, David, to note uh, is that over the years, the pattern in the registry, opposite peptic ulcers, um, as endoscopists got more and more comfortable with hemospray, more and more are using it as monotherapy in the registry in malignancy uh, rather than other modalities. And again, I think that's with increased um, in, uh, confidence in endoscopists. Well, I think that uh, actually was a surprising result to us, maybe not unexpected, but certainly surprising in terms of the 100% hemostasis. And um, I want to also mention, too, that you know, for the audience listening, you can ask questions, uh, address them in your panel to all of us. But um, for me, I think the, the real question then is, are there, um, is this an unmet need in this population? Are, pe are, are oncologists aware that this is available to, to treat these patients? Because traditionally, you know, they'd send over only the worst cases and there wasn't a whole lot to offer. And, and this uh, maybe represents a, a significant change in availability of treatment for this cohort of patients. Yeah, David, that's, I, I, I don't think I know this is an unmet need because, for, and, 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 you know, the, the hundred odd attendees uh, will, will vouch for that this is a difficult referral to take. Um, a, a patient with with chronic uh, slow bleeding from a tumor. You know, we have historically been fairly average at, at managing this, and and not because of our endoscopic skills, but simply we we didn't have uh, tips and tricks on this on the shelf that would help. Yeah, for sure, there are uh certain lesions where you know argon or, or yag laser may be effective um so so it, it it was and it still probably is an unmet need uh uh because by no means am i saying that the application of hemostatic powder is is the uh you know it stops the the, the transfusion problem. it reduces it uh I, I could not agree with you more that we need to get this data out there i think you know we, we've taken a lot out of the registry. This is probably, uh, you know, and, and full credit to, to Mo for teasing this out. You know, he did this on his own accord is to, 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 if we can get this data out to people and show that actually if your oncologists or your, uh, your, your community endoscop uh, endoscopists have got these patients on their wards, then, you know, let, 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 us, let, let us see them because we, we really can, uh, uh, based on, on Mo's, uh, numbers um, uh, help their quality of life and reduce their their requirements for, for blood products. Perhaps the next topic, and I know you recently had a, a paper published, is the post-endotherapy bleeds, like post-EMR, post-ESD. Um, I think um, one of the questions, I think let's do another poll here. Uh, what's the rebleed rate with hemospray for post-endotherapy bleeding? So things that happen that essentially are, are, I hesitate to say, iatrogenic, but that are typically caused by the procedure you're undertaking. Um, <clears throat> this, this is something, obviously, you know, no, no endoscopist likes to, to hang out their dirty linen uh, because, you know, but most, most people say, oh, I never have bleeding, but <laughs> actually we do. Um, and, you know, as we uh, have you know, collectively and rightly so, we have really pushed the boundaries of, of resective therapy. Uh, you know, we, we started off with uh, being very confident in mucosal uh, resection, but now as we go, uh, you know, deeper with third space endoscopy into submucosal dissection, we are um, encountering vessels that are bigger and, you know, <clears throat> angrier than, than, than we, we had historically. And, um, there, there are, you know, there are, I call this intraprocedural uh, bleeding, which is indeed nitrogenic, and the, uh, the, the, the application of, of, um, of, of coag raspers, thermal ablation, et cetera, uh, is effective for, uh, for bleeding that you can identify. But in, you know, in, in difficult areas, for example, the esophagus or the duodenum, 
where you have uh, you know big intraprocedural bleeding, uh, it is uh, impossible, I tell you, to be able to target a bleeding lesion. And that is where you need uh, a non-contact type of intervention, which, you know, the hemospray appears to be one, which will, will give you two things. One, it will stop the bleeding, uh, which is, you know, it, 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 at the time of that uh, compromise, very, very important in terms of ensuring stability for, for a patient that, that can then, you know, decompensate very quickly, but also may then identify uh, an area where you can go, well, actually, there's uh, there's the bleeding point. Uh, I shall uh, apply a, a clip or uh, I shall wash off the uh, the hemospray and I shall use my coagulation graspers. So, um, uh, you know, I, I would I would encourage uh, anyone who is doing complex, complex endoscopic resective therapy to, to have one of these on the shelf in, in case in those rare scenarios that you run into problems where you just can't see anything. So, Mo, you... you uh, were the first author on the paper. What what was the what was the rebleeding rate in those patients? So yeah, the rebleeding rate was about four percent. So I'd, I'd I'd go with B. Uh, uh, with, with, <laughs> um, but uh, uh, so it was about four percent. I I I am I'm afraid I didn't know that. I couldn't remember. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's awesome. So um, again, what can you finish the procedure? with spraying because of visibility issues. I think, uh, Dr. Avery, you mentioned a little bit about that, but how do you manage that? Yeah, I mean, look, the, it's a tricky, it's, it's, it's a difficult one to, to, to balance because, you know, the, you're, you're often, uh, you're not often, this is often an oncological intervention. You were trying to clear uh, 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 you know the the, the lumen of a, a anomaly which is either cancerous or precancerous, and so uh, ultimately you want to try and do everything that you can in that same sitting to complete the uh, the removal or resection of a lesion so that the patient has a positive outcome. At the same time, when you're faced with uh, uncontrollable intraprocedural bleeding. Your, your, your priority is on the patient's stability and, and cessation of bleeding so that they don't go from being stable to, uh, you know, uh, unstable. Um, uh, you know, I've had a lot of feedback from people say, well, actually, you know, we put it down and then that's the end of the, the polypectomy or it's the end of the, the ESD. I, I would turn that round. No, not at all. You know, I, I, I used it just yesterday on a a patient whom I did an endorotor on and, you know, had quite marked bleeding halfway through, I was able to use the hemispray and then I was, I waited and then you can wash it off, okay, with a foot bump uh, or, or, or irrigation. It helped me to delineate where the bleeding vessel was. You can apply coagulation therapy and then you can continue your procedure. Um, and, 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 and the, 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 the tips and tricks here that uh, is is really useful is is not to overdo it you know hemospray uh, you don't need to empty the entire canister is you know use little amounts and you will see this little red spot appear in the white powder you can then wash it off and apply your therapy uh, uh, but ultimately your your point is well made you know if you can try and re finish the resection and put this at the end. Um, it's very useful, and, that, and actually, Mo, you came up with some interesting algorithms in as to how this might fit yeah. in. Yeah, so so as Brian alluded to, we felt you know in in the middle of the procedure, um, you would uh, start off with some conventional modalities, uh, and then you know hemospray if you unable to achieve control. Um, if 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 there was no in the middle of the procedure as well, if there was no clear source or, or, or point of um, treating with coag or clips, you would use hemospray as a first line. But also at the end of the procedure, data shows, um, again, pointing to the idea of combination therapy, um, hemospray and a second modality, preferably coag or adrenaline, um, because um, applying hemospray, uh, even if there is a bleed, you can come back to the same resection site after four to six weeks and say, after a barrier resection, apply RFA. However, the presence of clips within that uh, defect may um, 
may prohibit that. But I, I think in a, a, another important point to note, so we had an N number of 73 was in terms of the safety. And that's always a thing, particularly when you've got a defect, um, that uh, there, was no, there was no complications and there was no perforations after applying the, mm -hmm. the hemisphere cluster resection site. And these are large endoscopic mucosal resections. So about 55% of the data is EMRs. Um, so large resections in the esophagus uh, and the duodenum. So, so safety as well, I think, as well as efficiency was another important factor we looked at. That's, I think, a, a, a really excellent summary of kind of where this fits in, in, that, in that scenario as, as well as I'm sure, I know personally I could go on for hours, but we're running up on time. Um, I want to encourage the attendees to ask questions. Uh, we can, you know, direct those to, to our participants um, and kind of move on to you know, the, the question and answer piece and see um, what, what, we're, what we're looking at here. Uh, I'll have to, I'm unfamiliar with some of this, but we'll look at and see about the question and answers that come in and I'll relay them. Um, so overall, how, I think, you know, we have specialty physicians entering the data. Um, we have um, applicability to community physicians and, and um, places that may not have 24-7 interventional radiology as backup. Um, I think there's, there's a number of different areas that um, are kind of our key takeaways here, but um, the, the registry is growing and we've put up here uh, a slide about, you know, if you want to join the registry, um, how to contact Dr. Hussein. And uh, I think some of the other points that maybe you guys confirm are, you know, hemostasis rates with hemospray are pretty comparable to traditional therapy. Um, and, and data from the registry shows that hemospray can play a, a very vital role in bleeding management, particularly in malignancies and, and as you said, the most recent publication, the, the new post-endotherapy bleeding. So um, uh, I guess one of the questions is, is there a demonstration? Um, I think, un unfortunately, no. Um, however, if uh, you contact your local, um, your local rep, they can provide uh, how best to use the device, and uh, also we have a, a catalog of videos that are available on the Cook Medical Hemospray website, so you can get first-hand looks at uh, other users in specific situations. So, any other questions that we have from the audience? And if not, uh, oh, a good one. I know in the post-endotherapy we have questions on regularly uh, for like ERCP-related bleeds, post sphincterotomy or post uh, antelectomy or papillectomy, did you see any concerns with that? So, so it's a, a small part of the data set was in the uh, sphincterotomy uh, bleeds, but uh, in that small numbers, it was effective. Um, and there is an image within the paper as well where they're showing um, uh, post uh, sphincterotomy bleed before and after hemispray, um, where the bleed completely set down. But the data says small on that. Yeah, Very I mean, small. David, I suppose there's always a slight concern that, you know, if you're uh, introducing uh, a possibility of an obstruction to the, the biliary tree, but certainly in the, in the small data set that we have here, there's, uh, there's none been repo reported. And obviously, you know, were that to be a concern after the application of of, of a hemostatic powder, one can always consider putting in a prophylactic um, uh, plastic uh, pigtail stem to, 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 to reduce any risk, but there's certainly nothing that's been re reported. And um, so I, I think that comes down to the, the individual sense checking that at the time of the uh, procedure just to make sure that biliary drainage is not compromised. Excellent. Another question came in. Uh, do you track longer term outcomes beyond the 30 days for the malignant patients? No, at the moment, no. Um, so we, 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 we kind of take, took a focused approach of the first 30 days uh, after uh, treatment um, uh, as that would be the time that they were most likely to re-bleed. 
Um, but I guess looking at mortality in, in the malignant cohort is always difficult because there are lots of factors involved being the underlying diagnosis itself. But the answer is no. So we didn't track the long-term outcomes with this patient cohort. Don't know really. No, and, that, and that, I think that um, the, 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 the big question here, we alluded to this earlier, is actually the uh, they will often succumb or exhibit their phenotype because of something other than GI bleeding. Actually, the, 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 the primary objective here is to try and improve or reduce, sorry, the, 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 the active bleeding uh, in the weeks following on. So I, I think we haven't got data beyond 30 days. I can't seem to understand how that might be clinically applicable in, in terms of data sure. collection. Sure. Well, that, that makes sense, and, and it's a logistics question. But we have one final question before I turn it back over to Barry. Uh, you mentioned you're a... a a large cancer center uh, seeing patients. And I know that one of the challenges is in uh, patients receiving really aggressive uh, chemotherapy or thrombocytopenic, but in particular bone marrow transplant patients with graft versus host disease. Do you see any any of that and is this useful there? Oh, listen, we, you know, uh, these these are really difficult patients. You know, my, my, my heart goes out to them and uh, you know, when you when you're faced with one of these patients, it really is quite demoralising when you have this uh, generalised mucositis or uh, you know diffuse ooze from, uh, from the gastrointestinal tract. And we we have had some fantastic outcomes on these patients in terms of of, of transfusion requirements. And you know that is uh, not just data based, but you know anecdotal from uh, from a from a lot of uh, uh, clinicians who have used it. So, um, you know, I, I would I would strongly, if there were no contraindications, I would certainly look at this, um, you know, in terms of, of just improving their quality of life. That's, I think, a, a really upbeat message. Again, a, a underserved population as it comes to solutions for treating those bleedings. And just the fact that you can stop the transfusions improves the scenario, what could be a, a you know, a perpetually deteriorating cycle. So that, that that's a very positive message. And I want to personally thank you guys for joining us today. Um, this has been really interesting. And, and like I said, I, I've been doing this for a long time and, and I could go on for hours, but unfortunately we don't have that. So I'll turn this back over to Barry for concluding statements. And again, thank you all very, very much for joining us. And thanks for all the participants who dialed in to listen. Um, so thank you, David. Thank you, Mo. Thank you, Rayhan. I have a question for Mo and Rayhan. What, as we're sort of closing out, we have another minute or two. What are your long-term goals for the registry, and, and how do you see the role of registries compared to um, prospective controlled clinical trials? Um, Barry, that's a that's a great question. Actually, you know, the uh, we we never, you know, when we sat down in UGW and had these initial we we never knew. We, know, we, we never envisaged that this would get, uh, you know, 700 soon or become 1,000 patients. And uh, Mo's uh, publications seem to be, you know, growing uh, exponentially. We, we, we well, the only reason I wanted to put this together uh, was to, to inform practice uh, and actually to explore where this, you know, it's clearly an exciting uh, novel device, but uh, we needed to know how and where to use it. And, and you know, we really are beginning to, to understand that now. And of course, any registry is always going to be uh, not criticized, but you know, it, 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 it comes with flaws for sure. And, and, and we're, no, no, we're never going to defend that. But hemostasis is a, is a tough academic uh, field to, to carry out, you know, large scale randomized control trials. And, you know, as a result, not many exist. Uh, but, you know, my, my conscience is absolutely clear that the work that we have done has really shaped our practice and then will continue to do so. There's lots of unanswered questions here. Uh, and, and that's the exciting thing about endoscopy. You know, it, it doesn't matter COVID or no COVID, people will still present with GI bleeding and we will continue to learn. And, you know, I, I hope in, in years to come, uh, we will have, a, you know, a, a broader spectrum of indications. Um, and we'll learn what we should do. We'll also learn what perhaps we, we should do differently. 
Anything you would like to add, Mo? No, no, I totally agree uh, with, with Ray. And I guess the uh, the good thing about about the registry, and particularly the hemostasis, is easy to try and capture that data. Um, and it's just allowed us to uh, get a large volume of outcomes. Um, and I think, you know, in the coming months, we can then hopefully more define where hemospray exactly lies within the GI bleed uh, algorithm, even in a more formal manner, um, uh, so that more endoscopists have more confidence with using it in the clinical scenario. That makes a lot of sense. I mean, I think, like you, like you said, Rayan, um, GI bleeding, um, it's, it's a really complex area. Uh, and there's, there's so many different types of GI bleeds, and, and they're all radically different. And doing those randomized control studies that we all want to do it still needs to be challenged, attempted, but it's hard. And, and def, definitely, I, I think we at Cook Medical believe as well that there's, there's a strong place for registries to complement those uh, prospective studies. And I, I think you guys are helping us figure out you know, with this armamentarium of clips and bipolar probes and APC and injection therapy, where does hemospray fit in? That's the question we've all been challenged with from the beginning. And you guys have really helped a lot together with all the people that you've worked with around the world to start helping us put together the pieces of that jigsaw. We don't have all the answers, but you guys are start, certainly helping us to fill in that picture and start to understand where hemospray fits in. So unfortunately, we're out of time. I'd like to, to thank the three panelists and and particularly Rayhan and Mo for not just for today, but for all of the incredible work you've done on the registry over the last few years. For the participants, thank you so much for joining. We will be forwarding on the, the presentation, or sorry, the, the link uh, over, over the coming days. So look out for that. If you have further questions, you can reach back out to us or you can reach back out to your local Cook representative. And um, if you want more information about the registry, about hemospray, or, or anything along those lines, we would be very happy to uh, to oblige. So thank you, everybody. We're exactly on time. And that was a, a really interesting, um, informative webinar. And, and we thank you so much for your participation.